It's been one year since COVID shut down recruiting nationwide. As of June 1st, 2021, things have opened back up and all normal recruiting activities may commence. Steve Sarkeesian and his staff of recruiters can now meet in person with the recruits, hosting them at our facilities or doing home visits. June is going to be a massive month for recruiting at Texas. Texas has four weekends throughout June where we will host a majority of our top recruits. June 4th through the 6th, June 11th through the 13th, June 18th through the 20th, and June 25th through the 27th. Let's get updated on all the major names on the offensive side of the ball. The defensive recruits video will be released shortly after. Get the update on Devon Campbell, Evan Stewart, Malik Murphy, Kelvin Banks, Brennan Thompson, and more. We might even take a sneak peek into the next year and see what Arch Manning is up to. But first, this video is sponsored by Last Stand Hats. Use promo code TEXASHOMER, all caps, for 10% off your new hat today on laststandhats.com. All hats officially licensed by the University of Texas. Link in the description. Inside Texas's Jerry Hamilton has came to give us the inside info on all the recruiting situations. You'd be hard pressed to find a more plugged in talent evaluator in the entire state. Subscribe to Inside Texas and you'll get to read all of Jerry's updates and learn about recruiting information in real time. As always, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll be alerted every time I upload so I can keep bringing you bigger and better Texas Longhorns content. Now, let's talk offensive recruits. Without further ado, let's get into it. Jerry, thanks for keeping us updated during this crazy month of June, and most hardcore fans already know your resume, but will you let the newer viewers know a little bit about your background? 21 years in the business, uh, part of the InsideTexas.com, have also been, uh, pretty much been everywhere, started at Rivals.com, uh, went to 24-7 Sports, I've uh, been with ESPN for a number of years, 10 of the last 13 years, uh, my background is a national recruiting analyst. Uh, state of Texas, obviously, is where I cut my teeth. My father was a high school football coach for about 40 years in Texas. Uh, and then also do a lot of national uh, stuff as far as rankings go. 24-7 uh, sports was one of the two or three guys that headed up the national rankings uh, for, for three years and then uh, was part of a four-man group at ESPN uh, that uh, that analyzed and um, evaluated all the top prospects in the country for the ESPN 300 and Junior 300. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. And uh, I just said uh, this job, you got to love it. You got to get out on the road. Uh, you got to talk to a lot of coaches and you got to put a lot of miles on your car. And that's what I've been lucky enough to do. And it, it's a kid's job, but it's a lot of fun. A super demanding job and you do it well, brother. June is the big month for our recruiting in Texas with official visits being held over these four weekends. What is the major overarching goal Sark and his staff are looking to achieve during this big month? What does Sark want to walk away with? Yeah, I think they want to walk away with all these kids really understanding, getting to know them, getting to know their personality, spending time around them. Uh, look, the Zoom calls are great, uh, but it, it's a total different animal when you sit down and you have face to face conversations and you see body language, you see eye movements, you know, and that goes both ways. Look, this Texas staff's going to be asked some tough questions this month um, by all these prospects. I think they want to come out of this with some really solid relationships built, um, making some key decisions, setting their board. I think you have a board right now, but I think that board can change more than any other year in my career doing this because there's no spring evaluations. You haven't met these kids, even the calls of high school coaches. It's not in-person meetings where maybe you just pick up a nugget walking through the hallway talking to the school counselor about a kid. There's a lot less of that. So there's more mining for gold uh, this month than ever before in my years doing this. Uh, but I think really setting that offensive line board, who you feel really good about, who you have work to do with, really building those relationships. Because and, and we just talked about the players and the coaches, but what about the parents? I mean, this is a massive month for the parents because the parents have to – trust a coaching staff with their child yeah the portal makes it interesting say ah, we messed up we get a freebie but that's not what these parents are looking at that's not what these kids are looking at right now um, they're looking at finding that fit and those relationships and that parent is, is finding that trust 
And a lot of coaches or a lot of high school coaches or the mentors are looking where their kids are going to be developed and give them a chance to live those dreams. And that dream is obviously the NFL for these highly recruited kids. So I think you put it all together and that's pretty much what this month is about uh, for the Texas staff. It's really zeroing in on who they feel good about, and that's prospects and parents, recruitments they feel good about, and really moving forward, maybe resetting that board a little bit. And then you have guys, look, we've talked about a lot of guys, but just remember this, there's going to be kids show up to camp. All right, let's talk quarterback updates. Malik Murphy will be in town on June 18th for that big third weekend. Uh, He's been playing spring ball in Cali, and he was seen at the QB retreat just last week as well. How is Malik progressing in his development? tough to evaluate quarterbacks in California this year, Uh, you know, just because they miss the fall season, they come in and play a shortened spring season, shorter practice time. So basically, you know, they had a lot of working. If you have a quarterback instructor, a lot of seven on seven, which I think is terrible for quarterback fundamentals in general, um, unless you have a really good instructor that you work with before and after these events uh, on a day-to-day basis. But Malik, you know, I, I think when you look at him, he has a high ceiling as a passer. Um, he, he's, I wouldn't say he's much more than a functional, maybe a functional athlete position. He's going to have to get the feet quicker, I believe. He's gonna, he, he tends to overstride and he has a little bit too long of an arm. There's a lot of things that the Texas staff can refine over the next two or three years to really get him ready to hit the field because he's got the arm talent uh, and, and and he's getting better at coming off that first read and making adjustments with the feet. But there's still a lot of work to do there. He's still a young quarterback and he's a quarterback that's lived off a strong arm for so long. Now he's got to mold and put the rest of this together to become a quarterback that makes quarterback plays and doesn't just make throws. To me, that's the whole key is how do you play under duress? You got to make quarterback plays when things break down, whether that's just sliding in the pocket and getting the football out with good timing, or it's actually being flushed out of the pocket and being able to make a play with your feet to keep a play alive and then deliver the football. Those are the things I want to see from Malik as a senior. I want to see more football plays from the quarterback position. Where do you think Malik's at on his developmental curve? Is he a year three starter or like, what are we thinking? Yeah. You know, if we're looking at it now before kid plays a senior season, that's what I'm looking at him a couple of years down the, down the road, really developing uh, with coach Sark and, and coach Milwee and, and really taking that time that the key for, for Malik is going to be patience. You know, now at the portal, Patience is tested with every prospect, but especially for Malik at the quarterback position where he needs to develop, it, it, patience is going to be the key. And I think that's going to be a couple of year process. And it's definitely been a strange time in the quarterback world for Texas with two big names floating out in the zeitgeist. So any word on the Quinn Ewers recruitment? You know, I, I think Texas is still reaching out. Um, I, I think it's just kind of a slower process now. I think when Sarkeesian and staff first got to Austin, they went after Quinn pretty hard, uh, and I think they made some headway. Um, look, I mean, there's a lot of people around Quinn that like the idea of him staying close to home, playing at Texas, the school he always wanted to go to. You know, obviously everybody's seen the photos of him as a kid wearing the Longhorn plastic helmet for Halloween or what's whatnot. But, um, you know, but there's also a part where Quinn, if he, if, if he's going to go somewhere other than Ohio state, he really has to come to that decision that I'm okay with what people say. If I flip again, and I think that's a tough thing for kids. I think it's really tough for quarterbacks. Uh, they get very analytical about things and, um, look, I mean, it, Ryan Day, those guys did a great job recruiting Quinn even after he committed to Texas. There's some strong bonds and relationships there. Um, and while Quinn hasn't maybe been as active recruiting as, as Ohio State would like during some part of this Texas transition, I think there's a lot of pressure there to be a recruiter. And, you know, obviously Ohio State now going after his really good friend and teammate, Landon Sampson, uh, you know, that may – that may tell some fan Ohio State fans, okay, coaches don't feel so great about this with Quinn. But right now, I think Quinn is fairly solid to Ohio State, and I think it's it's a situation where Texas is still recruiting him, but maybe they're not going with the max out effort they were because maybe they're maybe they're backing off the pressure that that was caused by all the people wanting around them wanting him to go to Texas. I don't envy these recruits at all, man. 
And the big name in the 23 class is Arch Manning. Of course, his family name holds a lot of political power, and due to that, his recruitment has implications spanning beyond the field. It's super early in Arch's process, but how is his recruitment going in its infancy? Yeah, it is very early uh, for Arch. He'll, he'll be on the road a lot in June. Uh, really, it's his first you know, opportunity to take a real look at programs. I mean, you think about these class of 2023 prospects, and the majority of these kids haven't met coaches face-to-face, uh, gone through the handshake process and the tour through the facility. Obviously, Arch has been through a, a lot of universities due to his family ties, but it's still different as a recruit now and as a prospect. Um, look, Texas is right in the thick of this thing. Um, you'll have we'll have one one some sources telling us one thing, other sources saying, "Well, you know, Texas is in it." Well, Texas is in a pretty good spot, you know. But so it's going to go back and forth, uh, I believe. But the main thing for Texas fans is that there's a, a real strong liking for Steve Sarkeesian, the offensive scheme, and his history of quarterback development with. Uh, Cooper Manning in the Manning family. Uh, and, and, you know, look, people have to go look, go all the way back to when Eli Manning was recruited. There, The University of Texas and the Manning family, this isn't something new. Chris Sims and Eli Manning came out of high school the same year as Matt Brown's first full recruiting class at Texas. Eli Manning was said to be leaning to Texas before David Cutcliffe was hired at Ole Miss, did Arch Manning, Archie Manning have something to do with that? Yeah, of course. He has some input, right? And David Cutcliffe, uh, Coach Payton at Tennessee. Uh, but, but if that hire doesn't happen, there's a good chance Eli Manning commits to Texas before Chris Sims flips from Tennessee to Texas. So there's a history with the Manning family and the University of Texas, and it's a positive one. And having Steve Sarkeesian here can only help in the efforts to recruit Arch because of the offense and the quarterback development over the years. I believe Alabama's in it. Georgia's probably in it. Clemson's in it. Will Ole Miss be in it? That's, you know, there's some pressure there, but I don't think the pressure has gotten to the Manning family in the past. Um, And LSU right now looks like they're way on the outside looking in. Um, But I think right now, when you look at it, however you want to throw them out, Clemson, Alabama, Texas, Texas, Alabama, Clemson, those are pretty much the top three right now. But again, he's just getting into the visit process for the first time. Just going to have to sit back and enjoy the ride the next couple of years, man. We have some exciting running back recruits to discuss as well. Jaden Blue will take his visit on June 18th. And of course, he committed early. He had an announcement about a week ago. He stated that he's going to set out his senior season to train for college. Now that the dust is settled, do you think we see Jaden play his senior year of high school football? Yeah, if it's me, I lean to him playing his senior season right now. Uh, spoke to a couple of sources about it, and they both believe he will play. Is it 100% he plays? No, it's not. Uh, but I think there's a belief that he could play his senior year. Uh, maybe it's just somewhere other than Klein Kane, obviously. But, you know, it, it's an interesting decision. Look, I mean, anybody that's on Inside Texas knows I don't, I, I don't agree with this decision. Um, look, football kids um, – they're three years out. This is a physical developmental sport. Um, you know, Jaden Blue's not a kid that, uh, you know, he's not carrying it 35, 40 times a game like Jonathan Gray did in high school or some other backs in the past. This is a different day and age. I mean, you're averaging 21, 22 touches a game. Uh, you don't have to pass pro much at the high school level. Um, you know, you're not asked to be a downhill bruising inside runner at Klein Kane either. That's not what they're asking you to do. They just want you to play to your strengths. And he's an elite receiver out of the backfield. I mean, he has got a truly elite hands at the running back position. So I was stumped. Uh, but obviously, you know, there's probably more than meets the eye to this story as, uh, as you have, has been talked about it inside Texas. But do you, th- do I think he plays next year? I guess I'll be surprised if he doesn't play next year, but look, this is, there's, this, there's trends that are happening all across football with opting out. Um, so I can't say for sure he doesn't play. But the interesting thing, having been at two Klein Kane games this year, is it's hard for me to get with you're on the sidelines wanting the ball more when you're in the game, and now suddenly you're not going to play. And that's always stuck with me throughout this situation. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. And we're still looking to fill that second running back spot. And there's some major names out there in Jamarion Miller from Tyler Legacy and uh, Trevante Citizen from Lake Charles Prep in Louisiana. Trevante will visit on June 4th. And what's the word on Jamarion? 
Yeah. So first of all, Trevante Citizen will be uh, uh, making an official visit to Texas June 4th through 6th. Um, LSU has always been the favorite there. Father played at McNeese, but look, they're, they're from the state of Louisiana. And anybody you talk to uh, that, that knows Trevante say, oh, yeah, LSU's always been the favorite, if not them, Alabama. Um, you know, has LSU fallen off a little bit because Travion Moss, another really good back uh, uh, in Baton Rouge. Then there's Branson Robinson, who I believe is the best running back in the country out of Mississippi that everybody's after, Georgia, Alabama, LSU, all of them. Um, but there's so much 2023 running back talent in the state of Louisiana. Does LSU take two this year if they don't believe one's on the level of the guys next year? So LSU's got some decisions to make at running back, and I think that's caused them to slip a little bit uh, with Citizen. And the point I'm getting to is Texas. Stan Drayton's been on Citizen a long time. He really likes Gervonta Citizen as a talent. He is a bruising downhill back, and what that gets to – is Citizen's also going to visit Texas A&M. He'll make the visit to USC, but really Texas A&M is a player in this. Does he fit more of the Isaiah Spiller mold, and can Jimbo sell him on that? If he, if Citizen doesn't go to LSU and Alabama doesn't offer him, I could see this coming down to A&M versus Texas for a late Charles running back, which there aren't a lot of true A&M and Texas battles, especially out of state, so this will be different. Jamara Miller – Look, I love Jamara Miller. Anybody that's been on Inside Texas uh, uh, since I joined Inside Texas knows I love Jamarion Miller. I love East Texas running backs uh, that are tough, fast kids, hyper competitive. I'll tell you a story real quick. You know, we have the uh, elite underclassmen camps um, with, with ESPN and Three Step Sports. And we had that one up in July in Durant, Oklahoma last year during uh, the pandemic. And Jamarion Miller has to get up pretty early. Running back to the first position that reports at 8 a.m. He's in line at 7:10. So he had to have got up at 4 a.m., drove up from Tyler, uh, knowing he's going to test out of the gates at 8:15 a.m. Um, and he's a hyper competitive kid. Now another thing with Jamarion, I mentioned it with Jaden Blue. Miller's got really good hands. Uh, Coach Joe Willis splits him out at Tyler Legacy. Uh, they get him the ball in the passing game. He, he's involved in the return game, and this is how competitive he is. It's shades of Dalvin Cook, who I covered coming out of Miami Central. Miller will turn around and play corner, and he is that competitive of a kid. And I'm not comparing him to Dalvin Cook as a talent, so people don't say Jerry Hamilton saying Jamari Miller is going to be as good as Dalvin Cook. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying from a competitive standpoint, there's a similarity there because there aren't many guys that will carry it 20 times catch the ball, be in the return game, and then turn around and are willing to play corner or defensive back. And that's what Miller does, and that's why I love him. And no visit scheduled with Jamarion yet, right? You know, Miller, I, I believe, is going to go to Florida, a possibly um, Oklahoma State, probably Alabama. Texas is behind on Miller right now. It, it, it's an interesting dynamic because his brother Damian Miller signed with Texas in the 2017 class, didn't get in. And the thought was Jamarian always wanted to go to Texas. Uh, and I think Justin Wells, who does a great job covering uh, recruiting in, in East Texas for inside Texas, would tell you Jamarian always wanted to go to Texas. Texas and Jamarian are not clicking currently. Will that change? I believe Texas likes him enough to keep the effort, the foot on the gas there, and see if they can make some inroads and kind of flip this recruitment, which right now looks like it's headed to the SEC or to Oklahoma State. And the final running backs for the number two spot are El Paso's Tavoris Jones and Newton's DeAnthony Gatson. They both have June visits scheduled to Texas. So what is the staff looking to do here? Well, it'll be interesting to see where Texas goes here. I think the eyeball test is really big uh, at all positions because, look, this is a staff that hasn't seen a lot of these prospects. They know the specs, but they still don't really know maybe to build the frames until you get those kids in person. Tavoris Jones is interesting again. Like Miller, look, this kid's from El Paso. He's come to an Under Armour camp in Dallas. He came to that elite underclassman camp in Durant, Oklahoma. He has not turned down competition. And for that, you know, you give that kid check, check for that. I mean, that that's going from El Paso to Dallas for a camp and Durant, Oklahoma for a camp. You know a kid likes to compete. And you know he wants to be a really good football player. So you always keep that in the back of your mind when you evaluate these guys. The interesting thing with Jones is he seems to really be banking on Texas wanting him and him committing to Texas. There were some there were some rumors he'd commit the tech tried to commit to Texas last year before the season. 
Um, I don't the, the prior staff wasn't ready for that yet. But Texas, the only official visit he has scheduled as of today, I think he'll schedule a couple of visits. But right now it's Texas, June 18th through 20th, and that's it. So that's a sign of a kid that really almost has his mind made up, and we'll see where it goes with the Texas staff. Gatson is interesting to me. Look, I like these Texas backs, man. They're tough kids. Um, this kid runs behind his pads pretty well. The interesting thing with him will be what does that frame look like? What does that build look like? He is more of a downhill back. His first 15, 20 yards are going to be his quickest, fastest uh, yards as a runner. What he's going to have to do is really learn to maximize uh, his leverage really keep those feet running through contact at a power five level. He's got all the talent, but I think when you watch him at the small school level, um, it's come so easy for him when you're evaluating and you're like, okay, what's he going to do at the power five level? I think he's got a really good skill set as a downhill back. I think that's what he is. So he's similar to Daniel Young. He'd be a good complimentary second back in a class. If you have a Jaden Blue or Jamarion Miller in that class, I think there's a good natural fit there. But again, it'll come down to the in-person evaluation uh, June 4-6 uh, weekend with Gatson. The receiver class in Texas this year is incredible, and wide receiver is a huge roster need for the Longhorns and one of Sark's top priorities. We have a talented early commit in Armani Winfield out of Louisville. I've heard Armani is solid to Texas, but just wants to fill out the process and take some visits. He will be at Texas on June 18th. So what's the word there? Look, I think I think Armani, he had a, a visit to Penn State, which he canceled. Um, all these kids want to take visits. And, and it's hard to say, oh, that you shouldn't be taking a visit because you're committed somewhere. These kids haven't been anywhere in so long. Look, if I was a kid, I don't care if I was committed or not. I'd be taking as many visits as I can because, look, you get a one freebie with the portal – but ideally, you want to you want to find that right fit out of the gate. You want to build those relationships. You know, you've committed to a staff at Texas that you haven't met. I mean, at the end of the day, so you you got to be thorough in this. Uh, be, doing this twenty years, all these kids need to be thorough. I think Armani's uh, is as far as solid commitments go. I think he's a pretty solid commitment to Texas. Look, he's for uh, Sarkeesian's first commitment. Uh, there's something that goes with that. The Texas staff wants to keep him in the fold. Uh, you know, as a player, I think he's making some strides. I don't think he had as good a junior season as sophomore season. There's a lot of reasons for that. He's back working uh, with margin hooks now consistently, which I think is really good. Look, there's a lot of trainers out there. Margin Hooks is legitimate, legitimate trainer of wide receivers. He's as good as it gets for a high school kid. Uh, so those kids in Dallas, Evan Stewart, a lot of those guys who we'll talk about. And Nicholas Anderson, Katie, drives up every few weeks to work with margin hooks. So the point I'm getting to is, is Armani Winfield's really working on his craft with margin hooks. And, and I think he's getting faster and quicker again. He had a knee injury, and I think that held him back a little bit as a junior. I think he's starting to get work back to 100%. And I think he's maybe reinvested with margin hooks after all the recruiting attention he got as a young prospect. And that's the key is who's going to maximize their talent. And now Winfield looks like he's back on track to doing that. Armani's a cool addition to this class because the wide receiver focus this year is speed and Armani can do more traditional wide receiver things in running and then catching. He tracks the ball well and he accelerates to it and he will serve a cool role in the new offense. He's, he's a smooth glider. Uh, what he does best to me, he tr like you said, he tracks the ball in the air really well. I think that makes him a good fit in this offense. A guy that tracks it with his eyes can run through the football and make the over the shoulder catch or those back shoulder catches. I think he can do all that. I think he's a good fit in the offense. Um, so I, I think there's a natural fit there. And I think he's a player that Texas has plans for. And in this special class, there's a lot of muskets that we need to help us win early on. Sark's scheme requires speed. So you're seeing special attention trying to recruit that skill set. So why does this year's class mesh so well with our scheme needs? Yeah, and to your point first, I doing this over 20 years now, the 2022 class of receivers in Texas is as good as I've ever seen. And it's because you have speed, you have size, you have physicality, you have run and catch receivers, you have catch and run receivers. You really have everything any program would need when they come recruit Texas or they're from the state of Texas. So first of all, it's a heck of a good year to come to Texas and recruit wide receivers for Texas, 
to me, and it's why Xavier Worthy was such a big, I don't know if we call him a flip from Michigan. I don't even know anymore. Portal transfer, whatever you want to call it. He's at Texas. He's, he's, he's enrolled and he's in Austin. That's all that matters is the need for vertical difference maker, elite speed, quickness, something that you can you call it take the top off the defense. I call it scaring the defensive coordinator when he watches the video um, and thinks about bracketing coverages, thinks about how he's got to defend this player, player X. Um, that's what's crucial for Texas in this class. And the good thing for Texas is I'm sure we're going to talk about him, but Evan Stewart and Brennan Thompson – I mean, look, you're talking about two of the best two sport athletes in the country. Um, obviously, Brennan Thompson's a 10, he got that down the 10 4 in the 100 meters. Um, and he physically, you know, he's at such a small school physically, his ceiling's pretty high. I think he's a kid that gets to college and gets faster. Um, Evan Stewart is just a tremendous athlete, whether it's 24 foot long jumps, whether it's a 10 6 and 700 meter, whether it's running the 200 meters at the state meet, whatever he does he does it really fast and really athletically. And that's why he's one of the top couple of receivers in the country and maybe the best speed receiver in the country. And that's why everybody wants him. Evan's commitment and decommitment was during weird times. It was way too early and during a pandemic. So now that everything has calmed down, is Texas still in the mix there? I know there's no planned visit as of yet. Yeah, I think Texas is very much in the mix for Evan Stewart. I mean, look, you know, the one thing about Evan is – I think what some fans have to remember is not all these kids grew up in Texas. They didn't grow up with Longhorn helmets on, right? I mean, uh, Evan Stewart's family's from the Memphis area. His mom was a track, a really talented track athlete at Tennessee. I believe she was an all SEC track athlete. Uh, father's from uh, the state of Tennessee. So he's not a kid that grew up in Texas. And there's a lot of those kids nowadays. Things have really changed as many, uh, as many people have moved into this state. Uh, so I think that's the one thing A&M, Texas fans, whoever you are, have to remember is not all these kids grew up in Texas. But Texas still has a really good shot at Evan Stewart. I think there's that's why there's a little SEC flair to that recruiting as well. He's going to go, obviously, to Florida. He's going to take a visit to Georgia. Alabama's in it. Texas A&M's in it. Um, he may trip out the USC. We'll see. But I think Texas is battling those schools. And Look, we could talk about this all day. Who's Texas battling? They're battling Alabama, LSU, A&M. Florida with Tim Bruce is really trying. Dan Mullen's trying to recruit the state hard. So it's almost we're talking about the same kids. And Evan Stewart's another one of those. But he is definitely still um, considering Texas. And I'll actually be surprised if he doesn't show up on campus at some point in June. I don't think a date's locked in, but it'll surprise me if he doesn't. And another major target for us is Brennan Thompson. And he doesn't have an official scheduled yet either, but he was just in Austin at the state track meet. So Brennan has 10 for 100 meter speed and would be a great scheme fit. So how is his recruitment progressing? Yeah, Brennan Thompson, uh, obviously he made an unofficial student visit to Texas during the uh, state um, t- state track meet um, or he competed in the 100 and 200 and long jump, I believe. But uh, uh, yeah, you know, he's going to visit Oklahoma State June 9th and 11th. That's his only official visit on the books right now. Um, I do believe Clemson and Alabama will get visits. It may just be during the season. I, I think that's kind of what's going on with Thompson right now is he's trying to decide, well, how many official visits do I want to take in June? He really likes the idea currently, and it could, this could change, of being at those stadiums, seeing the atmosphere during the season. I believe he's going to show be at Austin uh, at Texas the June 18th, 20th weekend. Uh, for an unofficial visit right now, then I believe he's scheduled to be at Texas A&M 21st and 22nd right after that. So Texas and Texas A&M, they're getting him on campus in June. He's already been to A&M for a student visit. Look, these schools are going to get that kid on campus in June, and they will, but it may just be unofficial visits and then use official visits later during the season. Stewart and Thompson are super important for this year's class. And a quick one for the fans, because I get asked about Kevin Coleman all the time out of Missouri. I don't hear his name much more. So is that recruitment still active or what's going on? Yeah, look, he's at Florida State. He's made, made a visit down to Florida State. I, I think Alabama's been the leader for the while, for a while there. So the ball's really in Alabama's court on this one. There's a, there's interest in Texas, and it's been consistent interest in Texas. And a lot of, with the Texas fans, they see that he plays for the fast seven-on-seven seven Adidas team out of Houston. So he's teammates with Jaden Blue, Jalen Gilbo, some of those other guys that are committed to Texas, top Texas targets. And so there's a natural tie in there. Um, I do think there's a chance Coleman 
makes it to campus. It may be during the season, but right now I put the percentage is really low for Coleman to be in the Texas class. Another super talented Texas receiver out of Garland is named Jordan Hudson. And he's not a speed guy like Stewart or Thompson, but he's still super talented and he's an early OU commit. And we heard he was more open back in April, but no visit scheduled. So what's the update on Hudson? Yeah, first of all, I'm a big Jordan Hudson fan. I mean, there may not be a bigger Jordan Hudson fan than I am. And for those that haven't seen him play, I think he's got the best hands and ball skills in the country in the 2022 class at receiver. And that's saying something. I mean, it's a great class of receivers in state, always a great class nationally. Um, Look, he's one of those guys that's a guard on his basketball team. He can he can bend. He's got really good ankle flexion. And people, some people have been like, well, Jordan, how fast is he? I'm like, I don't really care. Jordan Hudson's a tremendous, how fast is Marvin Mims? I mean, at some point, you know, look, it, it, the kid's really good. He'll throw a reverse spin move in traffic. It's on his highlight tape. He's just got great feel for the position. He is a true competitor. He plays through contact. He, I like the, I joke around, he likes to play in traffic. He plays in traffic and will snatch the ball out of the air with strong, big, almost 10 inch hands, uh, but just great ball skills, great feel. Um, where the recruitment's at, Jeff Banks was hard and heavy on Hudson for, uh, for a while there, and, and things were a little shaky for Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma's, uh, they've kind of, got things back to where they wanted it. So right now, Oklahoma may be the only campus he ends up on in June, but I'm not going to say that's 100%. Because look, with Jordan Hudson committed to Oklahoma, if he ever wanted to come down to Austin, man, they're going to try to keep that as quiet as possible, as they should. Uh, I don't think Texas is backed off of Hudson. I think they're prioritizing Evan Stewart and Brennan Thompson because there's an easier path there right now for the Longhorns. But I don't think Jeff Banks has given up on Jordan Hudson, and I think there's a long time until December. Chaz Preston was a target for us back in April, and he will be on a visit on June 18th. A bunch of heavy hitters have jumped into that recruitment. So do we even have a shot at Chaz anymore? Chaz Preston coming June 18th through 20th. Hey, Kid Texas really been recruiting. Look, Texas has a staff assembled to recruit well in Louisiana. Of course, it always comes down to does Alabama and LSU want you right now because of where they're at in the college football world. Um, I haven't talked to anybody. I call it the Pelican State. I'll stay in Louisiana. It doesn't think Shaz is going to end up at LSU or Alabama. So that's where I'm at. But Texas gets him on campus for an official visit. He is a difference maker talent. Um, so there may they may see a fit there. The Preston family may see a fit there. His brother plays at Mississippi State. I don't want to count them out totally. Uh, George is going to get a visit as well. I think Texas is up against it in this recruitment, but they're going to they're going to take a swing at it. And finally, for the receivers, we have C.J. Williams out of Modern Day. Sark is familiar with him, being from California, but he's not a great scheme fit. But he is a really fun receiver to watch, and he will be visiting on June eighteenth. So, what have you heard about C.J.? Yeah, I mean, I think Texas started recruiting him right out of the gates when they got to Austin. Uh, obviously, there's a connection with Malik Murphy there, uh, their, their friends. Uh, and I think once the staff got here and took a look and kind of evaluated the wide receiver room and throughout the spring, the Xavier Worthy became even more important. Evan Stewart and Brennan Thompson, okay, those guys – flew to the top of the board, right? I mean, it's probably a reason Texas hasn't offered Nicholas Anderson out of Katie, who I absolutely love, who probably ends up at Notre Dame. But, you know, CJ's a kid and Sark and this staff want to recruit Southern California and the state of California. And I totally get that. Uh, and I'm on board with that. I think the tough thing when you're recruiting CJ Williams this year is, like you said, it's the fit. I mean, Texas needs the speed guys more. Uh, they have some guys with size that are really good receivers. They have Armani Winfield in the class. So if you're only looking at a three-receiver class since you added Xavier Worthy, then I don't know if you bump that to four if C.J. Williams wants to, wants to jump in or not because of where he's from. And he is a talent guy. I say he's more of a possession receiver. That doesn't mean he's not a possession receiver that can't make somebody miss after the catch. But he is a run-and-catch receiver. He is not a catch-and-run receiver. And I really feel like Texas needs some – big time elite playmakers in this class. And tight end is a unique position for us in this year's class because we already have a bunch of them and five-star Jatavion Sanders just came into the fold as well. So it's not a huge need, but if there's something interesting going on, then Jeff Banks is going to hop on it. So 
we do actually have an interesting tight end named Arliss Boardingham out of California, and he's visiting on June 18th. So what's Jeff Banks up to here? Yeah, Ar- Arliss Boardingham will visit Arizona State the weekend before Texas or scheduled to. I always say scheduled to because, you know, look, these things change fast and uh, in June, but scheduled to be at Arizona State. Well, obviously, Antonio Pierce, Herm Edwards, and that staff recruit California very hard, and that'll be sh- true competition, even though some fans may look at it and say, well, that's Arizona State. Not the, not the case. It's true competition. What I love about Arliss Boardingham, and I said this on Inside Texas, I said, you give me a 6'4", 6'3 and a half, 225-pound kid that runs 4'7 laser and competes in track and his dad's a track coach, sign me up for that guy. Look, I've been doing – I'm in this business been in this 20 years. I don't have all the answers, but that's a pretty easy one when you've done this a long time. Dad's a track coach. Kid is a 6'3", 6'4", 220-pound jumbo athlete that can run. Get, that's the guy I would want in this class at tight end. Like you said, Texas has – a lot of tight ends in the program. They have some talented tight ends in the program. I think Juan Davis, Gunnar Helm, both showed they, they're they capable uh, in the spring uh, for Jeff Banks and the staff. But I've always said Jeff Banks is going to want to have a tight end in his first class at Texas. He hasn't recruited one to this point. He's going to want to get one of his guys. And if Arliss Boardingham's the guy, he'll be one of the more undervalued and underappreciated uh, recruits in this 2022 class for Texas. I think he's that talented. And that's the only major tight end prospect at the moment. So let's get to the much anticipated offensive line. We have no current commitments, but a lot of major targets with visits coming up during June. So do we see those commitments rise soon enough? I think there's a possibility of it. And look, we've talked to uh, a nauseam about the the in-person eye test and meeting these kids for the first time. I'm not sure there's a position that's bigger than offensive line. I mean, you really want to see the frames, the arm length, the hand size. And one of the things because of uh, of the pandemic is, you know, I know us with the Under Armour camps, um, we didn't measure arm length. We measured wing spans, but not arm length and not hand size. Those are huge for these college coaches. I mean, look, the arm length is bigger than the wingspan because there's some long wingspans, just broad shoulders and shorter arms. Uh, But really assessing those frames and and what these kids look like is going to be huge in June for Coach Flood, Coach Sarkeesian, and this offensive staff. I absolutely believe they've offered the right guys. I I think they have some really talented kids with official visits set up. And obviously, Devon Campbell's been on campus for a student visit uh, in March um, or April, I believe. And I believe he'll be back in June for another student visit, if not official visit, but he may save his official visit for the season uh, because he's got USC the first weekend in June, then Oklahoma on the 18th, maybe in Alabama, maybe in LSU. Uh, Nobody I've talked to believes he's going far from home, which kind of sets up the Texas, Oklahoma, LSU deal, although he will go to A&M and take a look at him. But I know we'll get into more of these guys, but I think Kyle Flood's on the right guys. I love the Cam Williams offer from Duncanville. People like, oh, he's 6'5", 390. I don't care. Well, if you've seen him like I've seen him, the dude's got an 81, 82 inch wingspan. He's got 11 inch hands. His shoes probably as big as shacks, and he's got to reshape his body. But he's 17 year old kid. But I, I love that offer. Jacob Sexton obviously is coming in out of Deer uh, Creek, Oklahoma. Uh, he's coming in the 11th through 13th. He'll be at Alabama this week. I think he probably goes to Oklahoma, but I don't think it's a lot. But I so I, what I'm saying, I think they're in on the right guys. I think Cam Williams is the latest offer. I like it. You got Neto out of Allen, which I can't pronounce his name, and I don't want to butcher it on here. I'm sure you can do it. Uh, but Kelvin Banks, I believe, is a Texas lean. Cam Dewberry, hang around the rim and see what happens, even though I think Texas is a long shot right now. Um, so I think they're in on all the right guys. Malik Agbo out of Washington, they're really trying hard on, even though I believe LSU – is the favorite right now headed in that LSU, Miami, Oklahoma official visits. We'll see if he makes one to Texas here in June. But I believe they're on the right guys. Um, size, bringing more size into the program. And Cole Hudson and Connor Robertson, I haven't forgot about you. We're going to get to you. But these bigger frame, bigger body guys, I think is huge in recruiting for this staff, especially Kyle Flood. So assessing those guys in June is going to be big. And hitting on Cole Hudson, I uh, was up at Frisco High a couple of weeks ago. You know what Cole said to me, which I love, I want to play center. Uh, there aren't many guys that come out and say, I want to play center, especially guys that don't play center in high school, you know, that play tackle and guard. Uh, so the fact that he's open to playing center, 
uh, along with playing guard, uh, makes him a higher value prospect for me. I mean, he's 80 plus inch wingspan, uh, big hands, really intelligent kids, six four and a half, six five, three fifteen. He's going to visit uh, uh, Texas on the 11th, then Oklahoma the 18th, and then the 25th. And the decision is going to be close to home. It's going to come from that. Um, then Connor Robertson out of Westlake, like father went to Texas. A lot of people know that. I think the mom went to Duke. He has a couple of sisters at Wake Forest. He had been up in Connecticut, then moved back here prior to his junior season. Uh, Northwestern, on June 11th, Texas the 18th, Stanford the 25th. It probably comes down to Stanford and uh, Texas, and, and Stanford probably has the lead there. I don't think he's a kid that's you know, looks at staying in Austin and, and playing for the University of Texas as his end-all, be-all. But I think Texas can win him over. And, and the reason that's big is whether it be Hudson or Robertson in the class, I do believe Texas needs a really good center prospect. So the ideal class would be Devon Campbell and Kelvin Banks. Then you pair that with a Hudson or a Robertson. And then you hang around the rim for another tackle body like a Cam Dewberry or Ogbo. Yeah, Cam Williams, who's coming in June 25th through 27th. I think Texas is all in on this one. I I think there's a – look, maybe it's the basketball videos of the kid dunking the basketball. Maybe uh, the Dunkerville staff sent some some videos of the kid really showing that bend and flexibility because when you first see how big he is, 6'5", 390, you're saying, how does he move? Well, you can turn on the tape and say, okay, well, he's probably 360 pounds then. Now he's got 30 pounds on him. But I think when you see the ankle flexion, the knee bend, all the upside with him, I think that's a kid Texas is all in on. But to your point, if you hit on Campbell, if you hit on Banks, you hit on one either Robertson or Hudson, then you've set up for your last two spots, uh, and they're in on some really good players at, at that position. And I would love to see Cam Williams be in the class. I just think he's a tremendous developmental prospect. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Oklahoma's pretty good competition there, maybe Oregon for Cam Williams. Uh, but I think – to your point, if you can hit on those top two guys, which, you know, look, they're probably must get guys in this class, Devon Campbell and Banks. Then you went out for one of the two interior guys, uh, Robertson um, or Hudson. Then you're set up pretty well to come, whether it be a fourth guy or a fourth and fifth guy. I think Texas needs five ideally, but it's got to be the right five. They won't just take five. It's got to be the right five. Good stuff, Jerry. And that's a wrap on the offensive prospects for the crazy month of June. So make sure to head over to Inside Texas and subscribe and you can get updated all the time with recruiting news from Jerry and the rest of the guys over there. Now, the defensive recruits video will also be coming out shortly after. So watch more of my videos here and consider joining as a channel member. And as always, hook them.